Good afternoon, folks. It's time for a critical review. I still recall getting into arguments with the USGS and Dr. Jeffrey Love in 2011 about the sun and earthquakes. Both of us dug in. Luckily, the scientific field has settled the debate. In just the last week, we got two more papers adding to dozens of previous ones indicating that the sun does trigger earthquakes. This one here was on solar flare impact and the other one was on the geomagnetic storm effect. Lead author on this one, by the way, is one of three NASA scientists who I have either worked with directly or have cited my paper on how the sun triggers earthquakes. The approximately 70 papers on this topic have pegged solar flares, proton events, geomagnetic storms, coronal holes, and solar magnetic fields to earthquake triggering processes. Most of these have to do with the integration of the solar energy into the global electric circuit via auroral energy, particle precipitation, or geomagnetic induction. All of that reaches the crust. The sun actually has a solar system scale version of this with its magnetic fields. This is what my papers are on. And now arguments against the sun earthquake connection are becoming virtually absent. In fact, haven't seen one for about five or six years. So let's review one of our most important videos. This is from 2020, and it breaks down your entry into the world of solar-triggered seismic activity. This video has gotten more professors and NASA scientists into our fold than almost any other. I hope you enjoy it. Decades of statistical correlations, recent advances in mechanistic action, the picture of how the sun makes earthquakes here on our world is coming together. Recently, we've been looking at a key discovery published in the Nature family of journals, showing that solar proton events correlate well with large earthquakes. In fact, the larger the earthquake, the more robust the correlation. Earthquakes will happen no matter what, but many things build up pressure and can help release it. The big ones seem to more often need that extra kick from something outside the Earth. The focus on solar protons here is outstanding, but it is also potentially too narrow. The particle forcing aspect of space weather is of the utmost concern for many solar terrestrial interactions, but protons are not the only source of the ionospheric modulation they say begins to affect the ground below. We have seen numerous other space weather ionospheric modulators linked to earthquakes, and this actually includes our published work with STATS Professor Dr. Holloman and NASA's Dr. Uyen. Essentially, we were looking at the solar polar magnetic fields, which reverse polarity every 11 years. These fields determine the sunspot cycle, their flaring, the solar wind character, the position of coronal holes, and many of the space weather modulators of the ionosphere. When plotted over time, short one-year oscillations are seen among the larger 11-year oscillation, and it is the peaks in magnetism, both high and low, positive and negative, those strongest moments, and the reversals of magnetism when they cross that center line, the polarity flips, which tended to correlate with the largest earthquakes. To put it simply, if it was all random, you could pick about half the days as significant and expect about half the earthquakes. If you guessed 10% of the days, you should get 10% of the earthquakes. If you guessed 99% of the days, you should probably get about 99% of the earthquakes just at random. We initially identified about 40% of the days, but got 80% of the megaquakes, the largest on Earth, about double what would be expected by random chance, the first hint of a real connection now half a decade ago. We also had a paper in that same journal showing how a powerful coronal hole surged during the great Chile quake of 2015. These are rectangular plots of the sun, coronal holes, and outflowing solar wind speed as judged from Stereo A, Stereo B, Earth orbiting spacecraft, and those at L1. Dates of each reading are in black at the bottom left of the boxes, and the speed of the solar wind from coronal holes is a great way to gauge the solar magnetic field strength in the short term. And on the day of the earthquake, that's top right, the coronal hole directly connected to Earth there was a major surge in power there. That energy came to Earth over the interplanetary magnetic field, and in a paper that made big news in the American Geophysical Union months later, it was shown that indeed a major surge of electromagnetic flow began above the earthquake zone just before the earthquake. Now the reason it was important to do this short-term surge paper was that the solar polar fields take 10-day averages, so 
Short-term surges like this one over a few days would never even show up in the solar polar fields data, and some of those other 20% of the megaquake events now begin to come into focus. Now folks, what you haven't seen yet is what they have refused to even send out for peer review. This was now two years ago when we updated the science. And working with a very talented statistics group from New York City and with Dr. Wells, a statistician from UCLA, we created an update to the initial paper on the solar polar fields and the results were staggering. 10,000 simulations confirmed at high levels the correlation and when we noticed that it was the largest magnitude events that were most correlated, needing the most kick from the sun, we ran 100,000 more simulations to test that principle, epic confidence and correlation. We sent this one to both GRL and AGU Space Weather where the academia famous Dolores Nip basically refused to even read our paper and, as happened at GRL, refused to send it out for peer review. Now she said it was because it lacked discussion of the mechanism of action, which it absolutely did not. She apparently didn't actually read the paper. In fact, sections 6.1 and 6.2 were on these processes and the mechanism. She also didn't like that I didn't explain why the largest earthquakes were the most correlated, something I figured was relatively obvious. They need the most kick. And of course, it was a great irony that the 8.2 that struck Fiji just after our research period ended in mid-2018 was indeed another hit for the model, we can now look back at it retrospectively, with the solar polar fields triggering the system happening right there at the peak magnetism of that cycle. And so, we come back to here, and frankly, I haven't thought about much of this since we got the stiff arm from the journals. It is both bitter and sweet to see this here, given that this journal as well once refused to send out one of our papers for peer review because, quote, it is not possible. But in their words, we indeed find the opening of a door to these larger scale connections. And when it comes to the solar wind, it's all about the particles, the coronal holes, the sector boundaries in the solar wind, the interplanetary magnetic fields. When it comes to the ionosphere and the manipulation of that electric potential between it and the Earth below, Nothing modulates it like space weather, and when they discuss the coupling, the reverse piezoelectric effects, this is capacitance, loading and unloading, and this is what we've been showing in the lab. I wish we could supplement their paper with Billy's plasma experiments because they show exactly what they are saying, what we said half a decade ago. The cracks or faults are the attractive pathways for the current. The material in there will be affected. Billy did many experiments with water, even showing how it will defy gravity and follow the rules of the current instead, pushing up from below. Their paper is free to read, by the way, open source, and veteran observers, a lot of it's going to feel like you are reading a description of Billy's plasma lab work. But we cannot forget, it's not just the electric potential and induction. The magnetic fields at L-shell levels interact with the crust. These are what reverberate in low frequency during geomagnetic storms. We do indeed have the induction in the crust, which again seems to want to follow those fault pathways, but we also have the global electric circuit, modulated strongly by space weather, cosmic rays, and the ionosphere above. And that can be what charges up the crust as well, where of course, it's going to work the water, iron, other metals, crystals, and even neutral materials due to the electromagnetokinetic forcing perpendicular to both the current and the resulting fields. What this does is open the door for all those other pathways to ground, and all those other modulators of the ionosphere and global electric circuit, beyond just the solar protons. And it favors the papers in the past suggesting as much. You can find links to all the papers we showed you here today, the new one in Nature, our one that was refused to even have the chance of peer review. Both of our peer reviewed and accepted papers on this topic, and even that one I said got ignored in between. I'll toss the link to the 2016 update in there as well. The race is on for the science world to look at those different pathways and the space weather that affects them. The correlations are astounding no matter where you look. For example, most of the solar polar fields and megaquake data kinda looks like this. They hit the peaks and the reversals across the central neutral baseline. With Earth's magnetic field weakening during the ongoing magnetic excursion, some aspects of space weather may become less effective in these ways, like the pathway along the magnetic L-shell fields. But 
Ionospheric modulation by space weather is only going to increase as the magnetosphere weakens, which suggests that as the planetary shield diminishes, the sun will gain more and more control over the electric potential above the ground, and in the ground, and therefore, more control over megaquakes. I'll see you in the morning for the daily update. Be safe, everyone.